I started when I was 19, maybe. 84 is a long time, so a lot happened. So there's a lot of other stuff in there. Um, it's about work that I did in the Kalahari, and then in Uganda, and then in Nigeria, and then on Baffin Island. And I, I went and lived with a, a, on a hill, in a cave on a hill alone with a pack of Denning Woes for a summer. That was a super experience. And fascinating. And, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and family stuff is in there. I mean, you know, lots of stuff happens and can happen in just one year, let alone 84. We're going to start early because Liz is ready to go. And um, the author's in charge at these events. My name is Dan Chartrand, and I'm the owner of Water Street Bookstore. And I'm so delighted to have you back, Liz. Oh, thanks. We were just um, talking uh, before the event, and uh, I learned uh, a new word. It is? Eukaryote. Eukaryote. <laughs> and uh, I'll let Liz tell you what that is. But one of the things I love about having Liz here in the bookstore is that I always learn new things when she's here. Um, I've been learning new things from Liz since my introduction to you was in 1987 yes. when I was working on, I was working at Houghton Mifflin and Houghton Mifflin published an amazing book called Reindeer Moon, which I think oh, was your yes. third book uh, I think and your first it. novel. Yeah, first novel. And um, I had the privilege of working alongside an amazing editor named Peter Davison, who was publishing that book for Houghton Mifflin of Liz's, and he asked me to go evangelize for that book amongst frontline booksellers and it was such a pleasure to do that and I've been a fan of your work since um, your your authorship path has taken many uh, twists and turns but the common theme up until this most recent book that has not been published yet is that all your books were about mammals and, and I never thought of that but it's true and we have today <laughs> appropriately enough a gathering of mammals here yeah. so will all you mammals yes. put your hands together and join me in welcoming Liz back to Roddy thank you very much and um, you can read that's the next book um, I've just finished and I'm sent it to a publisher but <laughs> in fact <laughs> to a publisher who is I'm looking at <laughs> and maybe 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 it, not it will be a fit but a eukaryote is any living thing you can see without a microscope let's put it that way the things that aren't eukaryotes are bacteria and archaea microbes okay but that's next time Next time I'm here, it'll be about that. <laughs> this is about, um, this is an autobiography, and it includes, um, um, I did, um, I went for several years to live among Kalahari Zhikwa Bushmen, and uh, in pre-contact times. And then after that, and I wrote a book about that, after that, I went to Uganda to, um, uh, with pastoral, um, warlike pastoral people called Dadoth. And after that, we went to Nigeria to, to do about an African city, uh, an old African city, Ibadan. And, uh, but we got there just before the feathers hit the fan, so to speak. The, the, uh, uh, the election, it, it, Nigeria had just won independence, and or just gotten independence. The w one of the very popular leaders, his name was um, uh, Akindola. Uh, he uh, was arrested and put in jail, and he his party was the, that was the Yoruba people. The people in the south would mainly be Yoruba and Igbo people. Up in the north was ma mainly Hausa people. That they were um, different culture. Oh, Nigeria had, I think, over two, may maybe four hundred different groups with different languages and different cultures. And then the colonial times, they drew a line on a map and said, "Okay, this is Nigeria," and all these people were supposed to be Nigerians rather than whoever their Yorubas or houses. 
and it was um, it, and it, a warlike atmosphere prevailed. It was it was like massive terrorism and massive very. And we, I had my kids with me. They were, I think maybe. I, let's see now. It'd be 1960. They'd be about nine and ten maybe. And uh, uh, so, and I was with my husband. My husband Steve <coughs> was. Um, he had a tremendous flair for political situations and he was enthralled by the political stuff and I, I mean we almost never saw each other. I was supposed to be, I was there for the New Yorker, I was supposed to do a, uh, write a, <coughs> the, the old city and the, and the old customs that remained and I made friends with the guy who was the chief priest of the goddess of Abaddon and I was starting to get somewhere with him. Um, he was a very stubborn guy. <laughs> and I wasn't getting very, but then the, so much, there was so much violence and so forth that it was just, it was, there was, and nobody would talk about anything except the political situation, which was, so I did not get the material for my book, but a lot of material nevertheless. Okay, <clears throat> and this is the part about Nigeria. The following, can everybody still hear me? Okay. The following is from a letter I should never have written to my parents. Violence and sorrow are everywhere. This region, and it follows, our fieldwork, are by now almost entirely involved with violence and fear. I recently visited a town where one man, for political reasons, was beaten to death and two others were locked in their burning houses and burned to death and another man had his hand chopped off before being soaked with gasoline and immolated, according to one story, or else pushed back in his house and burned with it, according to another story. The maimed and the dead were supporters of Chief Akindala's party. That party had opposed the action group, and its members were getting revenge. I made a mistake. Chief Akindala was the party, was the, was the guy of the, the, as they were considered bad guys. Um, I didn't, oh, every morning the radio announced itself not with words but with talking drums. These drums said clearly and in English, this is the Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation. The drums had tones, as does the Yoruba language, and the tones seemed to clarify the message, which without them might have said something else. To hear this was a sort of bright spot in my otherwise anxious and sometimes terrified life. But there was very little news. As far as the radio was concerned, it almost seemed as if nothing much was happening, although the roadblocks, the fires, and the killings were spreading. Even so, everyone turned in, hoping to hear something official, something better than the many rumors. Mostly we heard the usual high life and juju music. But one mem memorable morning in January, we turned on the radio and he heard Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. Uh-oh, that wasn't right. In fact, it was terrifying. The radio station seemed to be under new management, which must have happened during the night. People whose, whose phones still worked began to telephone each other feverishly. Eventually, it emerged that soldiers had killed the prime minister, also the premier of the northern region, also Chief Akindala, prim, premier of the western region, as well as other soldiers and important political f f figures. The rebels had taken over the government buildings and the radio station and God knows what else. In short, there'd been a coup. We didn't know this early that morning. We just listened with horror to the unfinished symphony. But I am here to tell you that if unexplained Western classical music comes over the only radio station of a third world country, the feathers have hit the fan. Because Steve was so knowledgeable about the political situation, the American consulate called him up to see if, if he had learned anything, but for all his connections, he was as surprised as they were. Then someone from the Peace Corps called to report a rumor that a Kindler had been killed, but no one could confirm it. What do you mean, can't confirm it, I said to myself. I'll confirm it, and I got in the car. <laughs> On the way to the Premier's residence, I made up a story to explain my visit. 
I would tell whoever wanted to know that I had an appointment with one of the Premier's assistants and would feel safe in doing so because I had already met that person and was sure that the first, at the first sign of trouble he would flee. As I approached the Premier's driveway, I saw a searchlight, the kind used to find planes at night during World War II, still on and pointed at the sky. That it, was in the, that it was on in the daytime, or for that matter that it was there at all, seemed sinister. The lights in the residence were on too when the doors were open, which also seemed sinister. And when I drove up in front of the residence, I saw the premier, naked except for his jockey shorts, lying dead on the lawn. So the rumor was true. Evidently, he was shot inside the residence and dragged outdoors. As I was taking in the enormity of what I was looking at, a soldier with an automatic weapon ran up to my car, wide-eyed and very excited. What are you doing, he shouted. He seemed frightened. I started to tell him about my fictional appointment, but before I could finish, he was screaming that I was in great danger and said that should leave at once, so I did. Steve called the consulate and I called the Peace Corps, but by then they probably knew about the coup because the Prime Minister's body had also been found, as had the body of the Premier of the Northern Region. The coup was said to be bloodless because not many people had been killed. For a day or two, everything was quiet. Even so, the radio continued to broadcast classical music by Brahms and Beethoven, which seemed even more dire than the unfinished symphony no doubt to remind us of the gravity of our situation. But there wasn't a single word of real news. Instead, rumors kept coming. We heard that the United States and Great Britain were angered by the coup and planned to invade Nigeria with paratroopers to restore the displaced government. Having lived at Fort Bragg, I didn't like the sound of that, as nobody would want to be in a place invaded by the 82nd Air Airborne. At this point, Tom Johnson, who was, he was with us, decided to go home and not a moment too soon. As Steve drove him to the airport, a gang of thugs stopped them, and Steve had to joke them out of burning his car. Not an hour after Tom's plane took off, the airport was closed, along with the ports and all the borders. We expatriates learned that we were hostages to be used unless the United States and Great Britain changed their minds. I should have gone with Tom, taking the children and the dogs, but I didn't. I thought that perhaps after the coup, the country would have a new government and things would settle down. They didn't, but at least some people were benefiting from the confusion. We learned that at the morgue where Chief Akindala's body had been taken, the attendants were selling view, views of his corpse. At first the price was high, but day by day the price went down until the body could be viewed for a shilling. But even at that price, I didn't go there. I'd already seen the body. A rumor began to circulate that American citizens would be evacuated by plane. I went to the consulate to get on the list. I then went home, and as I was going into our condo, my neighbor, a woman from India whose husband taught at the university, ran up to me because she too had heard the rumor. She was frantic with fear, with which I could certainly em empathize, and she asked for my help in getting her and her family on the plane. Yes, they were from India, but her infant son had been born in the United States. Hooray, I thought, and I told her I'd do everything in my power. And with that, I went back to the consulate and insisted that there was an American in our neighborhood who was not on the list and was too young to leave without his parents. He and his parents should be also, also be on the list. Miraculously, the consulate agreed and added their names. I went back our, and told our neighbor, who wept with relief. I wept too, but it was all for nothing. The plane never came. Soon after that, I heard that soldiers were massing at the school my children attended. Why were my children in school at a time like that? Because all the other children were also in school. The parents wanted to keep an air of normalcy, and everyone thought the school had no military importance. We were wrong. I rushed to the school, where I saw soldiers with machine guns all over the place some digging trenches across the lawns and walkways, others positioning huge artillery pieces as if they were expecting something. I didn't know who these soldiers were or what, or what side they were on, which is certainly the downside of being a civilian in another country's war. But on the other hand, what did it matter? I grabbed my children and shoved them in the car. 
Just then the headmistress, an Englishwoman, marched up to the commanding officer. He was loading his he was loading an automatic weapon. She coldly informed him that he and his soldiers were on school property and they must leave at once. Good God, woman, what are you doing? I thought, starting my car. The officer gave her the brief, briefest possible glance and went on loading his weapon. I later learned that the soldiers were establishing a perimeter. They were expecting an invasion from the north. Needless to say, that was my children's last day at the school, if only because I realized that the headmistress had very poor judgment. Thus, my children may have been the only people in Nigeria who found a silver lining in the very heavy cloud. Well, perhaps not the only people. By then, the radio station had resumed its broadcast of high life and juju music and introduced an, a new high life song called Machine Gun, pronounced Machine Gun. I hope the musicians made some money. <coughs> I wanted to go home, but the borders were closed. I thought of trying to get near the border of Niger by car, then abandoning the car and crossing the border on foot through the bush at night. I planned, of course, to take my children and the dogs, but the walk across the desert to the nearest community would have been difficult for the children and could only have put them in more in harm's way than they were already. So I didn't do it. <coughs> Actually, it wasn't really a plan. It was more of a fantasy. All this time we heard gunfire and saw smoke from burning buildings. Steve learned about one of the fires, not in Abaddon, but in Lagos, where he'd been staying with two men, both good friends, in hopes of meeting a certain lawyer who had taken part in the coup. Steve had requested an appointment, but the appointment didn't materialize, so Steve spent the night in the house of one of his friends. There was only one bed, so the three men shared it with Steve in the middle. All of them were asleep when the lawyer burst into the room. Where is this man, Thomas, he shouted. See, Steve sat up and reached for his tape recorder. The lawyer grabbed the microphone and delivered an oration concerning the coup, during which the governor's house had been consumed with fire. Steve later learned that the lawyer himself had burned the house. He had sent some thugs to do it, but being a lawyer, he hadn't mentioned his involvement. <coughs> One day an army jeep pulled up in front of our house. Two soldiers with automatic weapons got out and banged on the door. To say I was scared doesn't describe it, but I opened the door. The soldiers were from the northern region, and one was an army officer, a very good friend. His name was Lieutenant Ogley, and he was one of, from one of the small tribes in northern Nigeria, a man whom we knew very well. The other man was his driver, a sergeant. <coughs> They had been fighting insurgents in the north, but the fight had spread to the army itself, and non ebo soldiers were killing their Ebo comrades. Lieutenant o Ogley was unwilling to do this, so he and his sergeant were transferring themselves to the south. He came to see us, he, sh he told us, to show us that he was still alive. When the army jeep appeared, our neighbors hid in their houses. Suddenly the street was deserted with every door shut and every window covered. But there was one exception. Our neighbor, Phil Stevens, was in the Peace Corps and therefore more courageous. He came straight to our house because he was concerned for our safety. Glad to see that, he, that we were okay, he shook hands all around and joined us for coffee. I will never forget his honor or his courage. I had freedom from, from fear, at least for the moment. Now, that's, that's that part. So, if people have anything they'd like to ask, please do. And I just want, uh, it's not a question, it's just a comment from reading this book. Because I had read Reindeer Moon, and I read uh, The Next Animal Life, and then I read The Hidden Lives of Dog, and all that. Then I read this and thought, I had no idea how brave you were. Well, I, <laughs> it just didn't. It, I it wasn't didn't brave. Agree. You get caught in these situations, and there's nothing you can do. But I mean, you were really tough. And when the, when you faced off with Idi Amin, Idi Amin. I just was like <laughs> about to hide under the bed. It scared me <laughs> even just thinking about it. And you're not a big, you know, person. Well, nobody <laughs> knew that he was Idi Amin at the time. I mean, they knew his name, but they right. now Idi Amin means a lot. And yeah, at the yeah, time, he was just—I um, think he was a. But you knew he, he was, was 
lieutenant or a, a colonel. Something. I mean, you you had the sense that something he was. Yeah. He was a little. Oh yeah. Uh, but, Oh, he, yeah, he, uh, <laughs> he, uh, the Dadoth people were raiding their neighbors, the Turkana people, and the Turkanas were raiding back. And the Turkanas had raided and went back down over, the, they were near the escarpment, down into Kenya, because that's the, and Idi Amin had brought his soldiers up to, they decided to put an end to the raiding, or just to kill everybody who raided, I guess. And they, um, he took his, his he, with the soldiers went down over the escarpment into Kenya, and they, the nearest village they came to, he he just began killing the villagers and some of their cattle, and the Dadoth people they're, they're pastoralists and they are the, the guys I was with. I, I'm sure they knew every cow in Uganda personally and could recognize it, and they did not see their cattle in the, in this village, but. Um, but Idi Amin killed, they killed a great many people. And one of the Dadoth men told me that he, uh, a, a little girl was clinging to her mother who was dying, and he took the little girl and broke her back with a stone. Yeah. And the Dadoth, they're warriors, they, 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 their whole life has to do with being a warrior. And if it horrified them, mm. uh, it did. Yeah. And that that idiot mean did that himself. Okay, then he came back up from the escarpment, taking the body of one of the people, which they burned in a fire, to, and the skin burned off. Why? Yeah. And they wanted. He came, and uh, they came to my camp, and um, and he told me that I was supposed to drive the body in my car down to the government post about 50 miles away. And I was thinking, you know, will I take my kids in the car with the corpse on a 50 mile ride, or will I leave them behind with Idi Amin? <laughs> <laughs> Not a good name. <laughs> so I, I just, I, far from being brave or courageous, I just said I was, you know, I was sorry, I'd, I'd, I'd love to be of help, but my car isn't very good and it will never get through the mud and, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and he was angry, but... <laughs> it strikes me as pretty great. Instead of telling him to go to hell, you know, I, I won't do that. I said, oh, no, no, I, I, I'd like to. <laughs> Comment. You mean to beg him? To tell him you couldn't, your car wouldn't go. The car that wouldn't far. do it, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know. You get great ideas when you're faced with that kind of situation. You're very good at thinking on your feet, as we say. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. we're seeing the rise of tribalism around the world, or Aren't we? the reassertion of it. In your mind, is is that just our most basic unit of organization, and is it something that we can overcome, or...? Um, that's a... That's a big question. Uh, well, the first group of people I lived with, with the, were uh, hunter-gatherer bushmen. And they didn't... They weren't like that. They, they had found over 200,000 years of living in the same place in with very little cultural difference. That, uh, uh, one of the encampments was found to have had continuous occupancy for 35,000 years. Mm -hmm. And they were pre-contact. They, they didn't know about white people. They didn't, I mean, they knew about us. They'd heard about nothing good, but they'd heard about white people. But they, the area was, quote, unquote, unexplored. That means it was unexplored by Westerners, mm -hmm. by, you know, the Bushmen, after 35,000 years, they had explored it pretty thoroughly. <laughs> so, but, but they, they, they found that cooperation and uh, being linked to other people, their whole kinship system, their marriage system, they had a system of gift-giving partnerships. Uh, nobody was more important than anyone else. They didn't have headmen or chiefs because everybody was equally important. And the hunters who, who, I mean, the main, the, the main food was gathered by women, but the hunt, gathering, go out and find, dig roots and stuff. The hunting was maybe every few weeks, 
the men would go out. The hunting was very arduous, but it took a tremendous amount of skill. And they used poison arrows, so then they'd poison them. And then, then they'd have to track it. And uh, that took days. And they um, would often be without food or water for those days. Okay, the, the man who shot the, who shot the antelope and tracked it did not own it. Somebody else would own it. If, the, if only the good hunters, they felt that if only the good hunters, if, the, if they owned the meat, then only they and their people would have the meat they needed. So it, the, the, it would go to the person who had given him the arrow, the owner of the arrow. And that person would be the one who divided. And that way they kept the older people, the people who couldn't do this arduous work, they got to, they got to, uh, um, the, everybody got food and what they needed this way. And as to the, as to the, I mean, they were, they were the, it was 60,000 square miles was just the area I'm talking about. And that had, uh, the population was one person for every ten square miles, but um, so they were they were they were far away people. But the idea of of being warlike th that came later. That didn't come with us. I mean, at first, I feel that our species lived as they had it worked out. Uh, Thirty-five thousand years is a long time for for to have. And I mean, it isn't that they wouldn't have fought with other people. They, I mean, they could and would, but... Well, for one thing, poison arrows are not good weapons. It takes several days for the guy to die. Meanwhile, he can do a number on you. And um, same with hunting lions and things like that. They didn't. They even had a truce with lions. The lions didn't hunt the people. And th there's no easy explanation for that, but they, it didn't happen. Although the lions and the people shared, there were eight water holes, permanent, seven impermanent. And every water hole had a lions and a group of people because they were water dependent. There was no surface water in, in 120,000 square miles. And uh, so the, 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 the idea of cooperation and not fighting I think wasn't just the humans. I think the lions had it too, because if if things went south and the lions started eating the people, or the people started attacking the lions, one group would have to leave, and the people could go to another encampment where they'd be taken in. But then they'd double the population of that encampment, and the food supply would 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 uh, it would show in the food supply. And if the lions went, they would have to either defeat the pride that was there, or they would be defeated themselves. And then, then those lions would have to, it, it's, it's very tough for a lion to uh, live without water. They can get, there were little melons that, that they could eat, and they can eat from the liquid from the body of their victims. But it, it's, it's vastly better for them to have water. So that, the, the, the necessity of, um, I think, Prevented, um, of course, the people of one, or were of one ethnicity. But but they, when we came, they treated us not as dangerous strangers, but as friends. They took us into their system. It was part of their of their culture. And so I think our ethnicity, our other other mammals have um, ethnic issues, and uh, I mean. The lions, they, if another group of lions came, they'd have an ethnic issue. So it's kind of in there, but maybe just for a time we were able to get over it. And now we're back to where we were before, when we were lived in the trees. Interesting stuff, but there's no real answer, I don't think. But now, my goodness. Were the tribes in, interested in learning things from you? Well, they were. Um, uh, it's not that they weren't, but um, 
they had, it would be like if some people from another culture came here, we'd regard them somewhat as curiosities, but we wouldn't go and ask them about their culture. It just wouldn't occur to us, and I think that, I mean, uh, they had it nailed. I mean, they knew everything about their, their, where they lived, everything. And we didn't. So we didn't seem like these brilliant, educated people. We seemed like, you know, children. So, and as indeed we were. So, yes. You mentioned a few places in your book uh, during some of the various crises in your life that you would kind of go back to thinking about how these um, African cultures that you spent so much time with, that some of the people would have dealt with these issues and how that helped you to think about ways to get through your own issues. And I just thought maybe you could talk a little more about how living with them in your younger years and all, really maybe some other cha changes in your later life that came from all of that experience. Oh, well, that's, that's an interesting <laughs> question to answer. It, um, I think that I was 19 when I went and 20-something when I, when I went to Uganda, and then about maybe 30 when I went to Nigeria, and um, it was it was transforming to see the Bushmen. It was, and they became my sort of lodestone or parenting. Um, they, they, the Bushmen kids were dream children. My God, they were fabulous kids. They were. I, I can't find the words. They were very calm. They were very intelligent. They were they learned things. Even little bitty kids learned stuff, and they they could name the little bitty kids could name things. They um, they were cooperative. They they weren't punished. Nobody yelled at them. One of the things is that the birth rate was very low. A woman would walk 1,500 miles a year carrying a heavy load half of the time. And they ate non-fat food. They ate just vegetables and lean meat occasionally. <coughs> so that doesn't lead for high fertility. So the birth rate was, was really low. And also then they nurse the baby for four years, maybe five. And during that time, you don't get pregnant if you're nursing. Okay, so the kids were spaced far enough apart. So they didn't have sibling rivalry wasn't a big problem. And I mean, each kid was its own individual. I mean, I think this is the way we were meant to be. And to, to uh, but the kids were just, I wrote somewhere that a Bushman child was every parent's dream. So I thought that's a good way to, that's a good way to, to, uh, to raise kids. So I kept my kids with me when they were little. I, I mean, um, you're, when I was an infant, the theory was that you're supposed to, your baby is supposed to eat at certain hours and not in between. And so the kid, poor kid cries for three hours and then, can, you know, and the kid was supposed to learn behavior. At, well, this proves to be not the best idea. And the Bushman children, of course, were, they were always with their mother. She carried them in her, in her, in her room. She had a pouch in the back. She wore a cape tied here with a pouch in the back and a belt around her waist and the baby was in there with grass to be a diaper. And uh, um, and when it was when the baby wanted to eat, she she'd take it out and nurse it and that would you know. So the baby's needs were met. And they didn't cry. You almost never heard a Bushman kid cry ever. And they didn't I only saw one little kid have a little temper tantrum because he wanted to be with his father and his father was going hunting and couldn't take him. And he, he, he had a little fit, but that was <laughs> it. That was in years and years of being there. <laughs> so it, it was, and I thought, this is the way to raise kids. <coughs> and if I say so myself. Yes, and child rearing, learn from the Bushmen. Yes, yes. Yes. I just so much of the book is is about how the way you learn to see when you're in the Kalahari affected the way you saw other things and how that really allowed you to see animals differently and some of the stuff that you talk about in terms of you know, the ultras the uh, 
ultrasonic communication with Katie Payne, whatnot. Where are those experiments now? What are some of um, you know, the, the, the kind of work on elephant communication that you were working on? What, what's happening now with what we know about how far and wide elephant communi elephants can communicate? I, I, I don't really know enough. Yeah. Um, I do know that it was. It's now people are finding it ultrasound in, in lots of, of different animals, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought you'd find it in lions, and everybody said no, but they but they did find it. In lions, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> like, and a, a component of the cow, also how far it travels, that it doesn't lose, it doesn't fade as it travels for some reason. It's it stays. It has the same. Um, which I, not something I understand, but that's what, what, mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Um, and Katie continued, she, she did an awful lot of work. She went back to um, wild elephants and uh, had a whole research project going. Mm -hmm. But I haven't, I, I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't seen the results yet, but I, I mean, I'm, it's papers and I just haven't seen them. Is the, is the Bushman culture society pretty much gone now? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty much gone. The, no the, yeah, the way of life, the hunting gathering life is gone. But I was there maybe 15 years, quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the, the idea of sharing and connectedness was, was, although that was challenged by the, I mean, if you live in an apartment, if you live in a in a encampment, everybody knows what, what you're doing, mm -hmm. and if you have if you brought back a lot of food and keep some, you don't keep it for yourself. You, if you share it, mm -hmm. then they know that. And if you didn't, but they don't know if you're doing that if you're in your apartment with the door shut, and so that kind of thing, the lack of privacy, caused some stuff. Some stuff. Mm -hmm. Also, people started. Um, alcohol and maybe drugs to some extent, mostly alcohol. Just in the These were people who didn't have alcohol. Right. They didn't have um, anything like that. They didn't have drugs. They didn't have anything like that. Mm -hmm. And they kept their, they, to, to be, they had to borrow a lot of feelings. If somebody felt jealousy, they might say so. They would say that you, you're not sharing with me, you don't ever, you know, blah, blah, blah go on and on like that for a while. But it would be, uh, it would just be in the form of a complaint. It wouldn't be anything else. And uh, uh, and, and, but, and people would also bottle up their feelings if they felt bad. They, they bottle them up and their, their trance dances that they had were, it, were to do something about those feelings. Okay, once you get once you have bottled everything up, then you start drinking. Mm -hmm. Out comes. I mean, you're not used to dealing with these feelings, so out comes and, and I mean, people. Uh, somebody we knew well and liked very much. His son, his uh, son-in-law was, uh, was with the army, and he got into a drinking thing with some other people. And he killed his father-in-law. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't. When he came to, I mean, when, when he the next day, when he, he didn't know where his father-in-law was, and he didn't know what had happened. Mm -hmm. You know that kind of thing. Parallels to Native American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it happens to indigenous yeah. people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In Australia, what's happening in Australia with the Aborigines, and is that, is that also kind of going that? direction? I heard people in, in Australia decided, or the groups, decided to go back to the old way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, the Bushmen can't do that because the, the ecosystem has changed. Right. So. Right. But also they don't want to. They want to be rural Namibians and things have improved. Things have improved. The people have, a lot of people have jobs, a lot of people have been to school. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the Namibians, that, that way of life is gone. Yeah. But um, the other thing was, the, the, which I was going to mention, is that to see this was to see what it's like for anything, any 
creature that has to live in the natural world. You see, you see what it... And people, you can interview a person. You can't interview a lion. You could. So that, that, was, that was very helpful. That was, to me, that was a huge insight. To, to, now they're finding that animals are just as smart as we are. They have thoughts, dreams, levels of emotion from fear, strong emotion, to compassion, which is a weaker emotion, you know, that kind of thing. And, and we, at first it was just all instinct and automatic pilot. For years and years, that's what people thought. So. Yeah. So. I'll sign books for anybody who wants, or we can... If anybody has another question. What dogs do you have now? Oh, my... my uh, I had a 50-year dog culture. The older dogs trained the younger ones. Uh -huh. And perfection, perfection. They came when called, they did everything you wanted. Then the last dog died. Mm. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to get another dog because I'll predecease it. Mm. I'm 85, and I thought, you know. And my daughter said, no, go get another dog. Get a little dog, because she's, she's in a wheelchair, so she needs right. a little dog. And she would take it if I predeceased her. So I go to the pound, I go to the uh, Menandong shelter, mm -hmm. and there were two little dogs. You know. She didn't say, don't get two twice. <laughs> twice. <laughs> so I came home with them, and they, I mean, they, they're not well trained. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> husband got gotcha. you. Your husband named oh, my husband named them, yeah. Yes, Czech, Czech Republic names. He named oh. them for famous Czech authors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one is Kafka for Bob Kafka. Uh -huh. And the other one is Chopek for Karl Chopek, uh -huh. who was famous. So he told, he is a very good friend who's Czech. He told the Czech friend what the names were. Mm -hmm. Kafka, uh, Kafka, that was fine. Chopek. The guy just gets, he's, you, you're naming, a, you're calling our most best author a dog, he said. <laughs> Ka Kafka was a German Jew, speaking of ethnicity. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Call him a pig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the highest honor. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, it's you coming fun in. to it's do. It is fun to do. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm not an anthropologist at all. Um, it, it, people weren't interested in animals, so you really had to write about people. But since then, I've written about animals. Mm -hmm. and we'll continue. Yeah, to. Ever good. since I was a kid. In fact, the school librarian, when I was in about fifth grade, wouldn't let me take any more books about animals out of the library. But she said, you should read about people. And I thought, no, this is, I drew the line at that age. <laughs> and it's been animals ever since. One of the things that, that I think is important is that most of us really know very little about the natural world now. And I wrote another book, I don't know if it's going to get published or not, but I wrote it, about the natural world. And the kind of the stuff we don't know or don't, don't think of. And there is so much, I mean, we can't possibly know even 1% probably, but that 1% is good at that much. And it's, it's a fascinating place, fascinating, fascinating place.